If we go back 100 years, 100 years ago, we had 11 universities. And today we have 789 universities, 11,443 autonomous colleges. Has the quality of education changed in 100 years? I think that's the most telling comment on us, which everybody is saying that most of our products from our institutions are unemployable. What they lack is confidence in themselves. What they lack is understanding and insecurity because they have no skills. But uh, the illiterate carpenter who comes from Jharkhand, he has that, he's bubbling with the confidence. Do roti kama lenge because he has the confidence of his skills, which our students don't seem to have. And it's not only we who feel this, I picked this off the internet. Somebody else has made this command. 15 years of schools, what's the result? Information without understanding, unable to earn a living or do anything useful, unable to take care of themselves, hate what they learn, great exams results which mean nothing. So my question is, why? Who is responsible? It's not the government which is responsible. It's not the examination board which is responsible. It's not the syllabus which is responsible. The responsibility is ours, the teachers. So we need to ask why this has happened and then moving ahead, what is it we need to do to rectify this? If we look at the human being very clearly, there are three clear perceptible dimensions of ourselves. There's the physical body, there's the mind which thinks, and then there's that energy which sustains us. When it's there, we are alive. When it's gone, we are dead. Now, we take care of the physical very easily, especially if we are affluent enough. Take the right food, have the space to play. There are some schools which run in single buildings. And if you're fortunate enough and affluent enough, you have a school with enough play area, enough trees. That's at one level. But when you come down to the essence of learning, what is this movement of learning and understanding? This is something that we don't seem to ask in the education system at all. Neither we ask that. If we ask it, then we would say, what are its prerequisites? We would also say, what are its barriers? Knowledge, dis learning is a discovery. Knowledge is the shadow of that discovery. So you don't have to be accumulating knowledge. You only have to be discovering. When you discover information, knowledge that is necessary will come to you. You don't have to make the effort. So a basic question which has never been asked, where does learning happen in this human being? It doesn't happen at the body. Can it happen at the level of thinking? Thinking is only recognition and projection of a conclusion or an imagination. So learning can't be at the level of thinking. Therefore, learning can only be at the level of that energy which is there in every one of us. That's something fundamental to education, but something that we never look at when we step into the classroom. So what is it that you need to be able to have that dimension of learning and understanding? First, you need a questioning mind, a mind that is never accepts anything passively, then you need the absence of fear. And the greatest fear is the fear of failure. Why should you have a fear of failure? If you are on your journey, you are what you are. Where is the need to compare? And finally, the journey is more important than the goal. The end doesn't matter. If today's step is in the right direction, I have to reach the right step. So all I need to do look, look at is, is my step today in the right direction and nothing more. Look at a young baby's face. Is there a single child in this world who doesn't have that curiosity coming out from the face? We make sure that they come through the system and the curiosity is killed. So we need to ask why that happens. So this is the bane of our education today, stuffing information. Now it is un understandable that the layman in the street is impressed by an accumulation of information. It's even understandable that parents don't have the time to investigate all this. They are where they are, they are anxious, they have their own attachments. 
they don't have the time to understand this but what about us teachers who spent a lifetime in education don't we have this understanding asking why we are just pointlessly accumulating information to modify this we come up with different strategies we come up with project approach huh? <laughs> and then that becomes a business somebody is available to help you there let me just go back 3 weeks in time we had a gathering of parents and students in the school staying over and there was this one child in class 5 and she came to me and said uncle can i get a pair of scissors i have a project to complete i said sure let's go home and get it and then i asked her what's your project about and she said h c mukherjee i said who's he she said father of the constitution i said what's that and she said that's rules of the country so my curiosity was peaked further i said where do you get all this information and she said we searched my mother i in all our books we couldn't find it so we go to the internet and i asked at that time why are we giving a project in our school i'm saying why are we giving a project of this kind where a child has to go to the net copy down some information write it down paste some pictures project is done if i was the teacher in that class i would say the constitution is a tremendously important project to do i wouldn't do it in one day i would take the whole year what would i do first i would start with why do we need a framework of a constitution then you come to this point that today's generation of children their grandparents are born after 1947 so they don't know what it is to in what is colonial rule they have no feeling about it so there's no first hand explanation so i would go to literature i would read ruskin bond i would read passage to india i would read bhavani junction these are available as movies also so somewhere in that i would try to say what does it mean to live when a foreign country is ruling you get a feel of it I, then you understand why you don't want to live under anybody's subjugation having understood that i would ask what is the model of this entire democracy that we talk about and two documents will come out one is the magna carta of great britain and the american declaration of independence so we would go into a, the circumstances which brought the magna carta the circumstances that brought the american war of independence and read a little bit of that document but then i would ask a very different question i would say these people were so particular about having freedom for themselves what did they do to the people of the land which they went into the native indians were completely wiped out from america sent into reservations they imported african slaves from to work on their plantations and then you talk about freedom so is freedom only for you can that ever happen and it's the same with the english what did they do with australia and the aborigines there so where is freedom then what's the implication of freedom who doesn't want freedom we all want it but the first thing you understand is if i must have freedom every other person every other living being must have freedom too which means i have to restrict my freedom so that the other person can also have his freedom the moment such an understanding comes one would understand what is the problem with the environment today so we have gone into freedom we have covered this entire aspect now doing all, through all these questions would not the student have accumulated the information about the constitution that was necessary certainly he would have got it and he would have got it with understanding so that is an intelligent way of doing a project just saying project method doesn't mean a thing now i come down to a very different question what is creativity is creativity only in the art in music in writing poetry isn't there creativity in academic studies now we don't give the feeling that there's creativity in academic studies that is to be crammed examination is to be passed you have to hate the subject for the rest of your life and whose mistake is that it comes back to me again as the teacher so what is creativity i think it is worth asking this we know that there is a gravitational field we can't see it but we can from the actions that happen we know there is a gravitational field so we know there is creativity it's the expression of that energy that is there inside us the energy is always ready to express what we are doing is restricting that expression with our thinking our intellect and our body so we only restrict expressions so all we have to do is step back a little bit from this intellect 
and let that creativity express in every moment of the life. Wouldn't that make more meaning? So, if we say that the body is physical and thinking is mental, then you have to say that that energy is inward or spiritual. Somewhere we have left out the spiritual dimension completely from education. It's a very scary word. We don't want to get into it. We prefer to be scientific. And this is our problem. We have taken technology and science from the West. It has its benefits, but we have taken it so blindly, science cannot accept this dimension of spirituality because that's outside the control of the intellect. And therefore, we don't talk about it at all. We don't look at it at all. We have to integrate that spirituality into our education, and that's the legacy we are sitting on. Tens of thousands of years of legacy of inquiry, asking what is the source of all this energy? Is there an energy without a cause? Questions which have never been asked in the West. We have it, and we don't bring it into our education at all. So, finally, the third aspect of it, we keep building up the identity of the individual. Everybody is working for his identi identity. My work is my identity. You ask me what I am, and I say I'm a teacher. So my profession is my identity. We never ask what is behind this identity. Why are we so afraid of letting go of this identity? We don't question that at all. So if we, and because we don't bring the spiritual question into education, we have this result of 15 years of schooling. So, what is it that we need to do? We need to address only these, the greater, which is allow the curiosity to remain so that questioning remains, allow creativity to express itself, question identity. If we do this, would not every requirement of education be taken care, including livelihood skills, social skills, whatever? So you only have to address this. You don't have to address curriculum, how you teach a subject, which subject you teach, what the Professor Pant pointed out, that these barriers of subjects have to go. All that becomes true if we are addressing this. Therefore, the question comes, what's the role of the teacher? Is the teacher an instructor? What can you instruct? You can instruct only something dead. The living thing cannot be instructed. It has to be lived. So you, a teacher is not an instructor. Is the teacher a guide? To be a guide, you must have reached. So the teacher is only another student, just like the, stu the younger student. There is a difference in age. There is a difference in experience. But we are all students. We are not any different. Once you understand that, then you understand this extraordinary statement. When you teach, to learn. The student learns. And you also learn all your life. Therefore, learning never ends. I spent yesterday with my daughter here, and I was introduced to this gadget called Alexa. Right? Alexa, what's up? And it says, the weather is this, and this is happening. And I said, what kind of a life have we brought ourselves to where you have to get a machine to talk to you so that you feel you're having a conversation? But that's incidental. What that gadget showed me was every single livelihood skill that we are preparing our students for is going to be taken over by the machine, as both the speakers pointed out earlier. So every single skill. Tomorrow you are going to have a situation where you won't have all these gadgets and computer, keyboards and whatnot. You will think, and the computer will think your, pick up your thought wave and move ahead. That's the level to which technology is going to develop. What is there in the human being which the machine can never take over? Discovery, creativity. It, machine can never be creative. The machine can never discover. That is something that happens at the level of the spiritual. And that is what we should be focusing on in education. Nothing else. Here I would like to question, bring about this whole question of aging. Buddhists say, Four sorrows, birth is the first sorrow, illness is the second, old age is the third, death is the fourth. So what is born has to age, has to die. But I question this a little bit, right? I am suggesting there are three aspects to aging. There is One is the chronological age measured from the day I was born. That moves only in one direction, you can't change it. 
The next is the physical aging. The body has to age, it has to deteriorate. That is also inevitable. But the mental age, does it have to age? If you look at our graph of mental capacity, we reach the peak of mental capability between the age of 20 and 25. Not only is this a movement which goes in either direction, you can remain 25 forever. And wouldn't you agree that Professor Pant is 25 years old mentally? And if he can be, why can't any of us be? Is it restricted to only a few? So it's there in us. If we are learning and if we are allowing that creativity to express itself, we are young. So it's in our hands, not in the hands of any system. <clears throat> Therefore, the challenge to me is, how do you educate the teacher to be creative? Now, the teacher comes through the same system that we have come in. He has never been exposed to something else. So, how do you educate a teacher to be creative? Because if a teacher is creative in the sense that we have talked about, then something of that creativity is going to inspire that student. And that's what we lack in teaching today. Teaching, the physician, and the priest. These are three prof professions which are not careers. The, you, the work is its own reward. So long as you come to teaching because it's a job and it gives you a nice salary, then you are not meant to be a teacher or a physician or a priest, if I may suggest. So teaching is its own reward. Come to it because it's a way of living. It's your vocation. You love to do it. When you do something that you love, you will communicate to the student that, look, this love for doing something is its own reward. You have to communicate it by action. Unfortunately, academic institutions don't want to invest in teacher training. They for a very simple reason. They say, what's the point of investing in the teacher? We don't know how long he's going to be with us. But there my response is, look at this big banyan tree that you have outside. The person who planted it, did he think whether he would ever sit under it? It would not possible. There are some things you do, not for yourself. And when you as an academic administrator employ an experienced teacher, as in somebody else paid for their teaching, to give a little back, be a little generous, invest in teacher training. And what do I mean by invest in teacher training? Not send them to some other course, right? We, you heard the previous speakers talk about the impact of technology, right? Why are we so stingy that we won't provide a teacher with a laptop and an internet connectivity, pay for it. Maybe in the beginning they'll only check mail. Maybe they will only surf, but in that process they become familiar with that gadget. The smartphone has done that to a great extent. But that is investment is by the teacher, not by the schools, right? So support them, give them this equipment, ask them to travel, ask them out of the school time, not on the vacation time. Pay for that travel and then demand and say that you go for a travel, go to the Himalayas, come back, make a presentation to your students about the Himalayan trip. Only when you make a presentation, you start learning to express. Demand this from the teachers, but then invest in that training. And I would just like to end with the metaphor of the sapling. That same banyan tree, when you want the banyan tree to come up, what do you do? You dig a hole, put the sapling, give it some water, allow the sunshine, and then you step back. And the life that is inside will grow. You don't have to do anything else. Just provide that and step back. Please do this with teachers. Then you will see a difference in education. I don't think anything else will do it. Thank you very much.